Secrets and Spies presents Espresso Martini with Chris Carr and Matt Fulton. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Espresso Martini. Matt, how are you doing? Hey, Chris, I'm good. Uh, I got my big ass Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee here, so I am I'm ready to go. Nice. I've yeah. I've stupidly got a hot coffee. Um, I don't know why I'm doing oh. this to myself, but there we go. Um, maybe I'll let it cool down a bit. You guys don't have Dunkin' Donuts over there, do you? We don't have Dunkin' Donuts. No, we have uh, many. We have a lot of coffee shops, um, and mm-hmm. there's certainly no excuse for me not going out to get a coffee. I get. I'm 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 a subscriber to Pret or Pret a Manger. They have this brilliant coffee yeah. deal. Uh, and they're not a, they're not a supporter of this podcast, but I highly recommend it because it saved me a lot of money on coffees and get like five a day for um, twenty five pounds a month. You can get basically five a day for the whole month, so that saves a fortune. Five coffees a day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be like, I'd be like hearing colors at that point. Oh, would you? Like, God, well, I average about six a day sometimes. So. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, yeah, not as bad as David Lynch, wow. who allegedly has something in the region of twelve a day or something like that. I read somewhere. Now I know why David Lynch is the way he is. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and has all those coffee references in Twin Peaks. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> so yeah, so there we go. So yeah, we Jeez. are. I'm fully caffeinated. Uh, apparently, apparently, I'm still vaccinated, but there we go. I don't know about you, but <laughs> mm. but uh, but there yeah. we go. Yeah, we haven't had any boosters. I think um, I think COVID sort of a, a, a at least from a government and healthcare point of view, a bit of a thing of the past now, isn't it? But there we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 about a year off yeah. from actually get having COVID, mm. uh, but my. I think my booster's up in, in October or something. Yeah, I guess yeah. I'm getting a new one then. I yeah, don't know. I didn't know what's going on boosters, but there are a whole... Oh, maybe we should consult Dan. He seemed to be quite knowledgeable about all that sort of stuff. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, so uh, coffee and vaccines aside, so today on Espresso <laughs> Martini, um, we're, we're taking a look at uh, cluster munitions being supplied to Ukraine. Uh, we've also got Putin and Prigozhin's post-mutiny meeting, which I'm sure was very interesting, um, and Ukraine's future membership of of NATO. On Extra Shot that follows this show on Patreon, we'll be looking at Russian spies in Switzerland, a Mossad operation deep in Iran, CIA Director William Burns' keynote speech at the Ditchley Foundation, and Vladimir Putin's secret train. So to get access to Extra Shot, which ha- follows immediately after the show, you'll need to be a Patreon subscriber, so just go to patreon.com forward slash secrets and spies and depending on which subscription level you pick you'll get a free set of secrets and spies coasters or a coffee cup and by subscribing you'll be directly supporting this podcast so a big thank you in advance for your support and a huge thank you to existing subscribers your support is very much appreciated and it will help us keep this podcast going so we'll move on to our first topic and uh, matt what i'll do I'll, I'll, as always i'll i'll read the uh, key points and then come to you for your initial thoughts so uh, bear with me um we're going to be looking at the u.s government's announcement that they will be supplying cluster munitions to ukraine i'm um, going to draw key points from an article by dr jack wattling and professor justin bronk from the royal united services institute and that article was titled giving ukraine cluster munitions is necessary legal and morally justified. And just before I begin, just a note for those unfamiliar with the Royal United Services Institute, otherwise known as RUSI. It is a defence and security think tank with its headquarters in London, and it was founded in 1831 by the Duke of Wellington, Sir Arthur Wellesley. So it's quite an old organisation now. So uh, I'll go to the key points. Uh, The US decision to provide Ukraine with cluster munitions has faced objections from campaign groups, but these objections fail to consider the military context and the intended use of these weapons. Ukraine is currently engaged in an offensive to break through Russian defences and liberate occupied territory. The use of cluster munitions would be valuable in this scenario as they can effectively target entrenched troops and increase the efficiency of Ukrainian artillery fire. The objections raised by activist groups regarding the legality and ethics of the cluster munitions are flawed as these weapons are not prohibited under international law and the potential risks to civilians can be mitigated through careful targeting and clearance operations after the conflict. 
By supplying Ukraine with cluster munitions, the US would enhance Ukraine's military effectiveness against Russian forces and address ammunition shortages and barrel limitations faced by Ukrainian artillery. Now, one interesting point, um, apparently artillery is actually breaking in Ukraine, probably from overuse, and this is of a great concern to the Pentagon. So the barrel limitations Mm -hmm. is to do with the shortages of working artillery. Um, So back to other key points, Um, the increased effectiveness from the use of cluster munitions can also create incentives for Russia to end the conflict. The intended use of these weapons by the armed forces of Ukraine against fortified Russian positions in open countryside combined with responsible marking and clearance operations aligns with the principles of proportionality and discrimination. Ultimately, providing Ukraine with cluster munitions is crucial for restoring peace and the rights of Ukraine's civilian population to live without occupation. The article concludes that the provision of cluster munitions to Ukraine is justified both militarily and strategically. The objections raised by groups like Human Rights Watch regarding the use of cluster munitions are based on misleading legal arguments and false equivalences between Russian and Ukrainian use cases. So, Matt, I will hand this over to you for a moment. What are your thoughts on all of this. I think you hit a lot of the good points there. I was sort of, when I first heard this story break, I was a little unsure how to feel. I mean, cluster munitions is sort of just like you hear it and you're like, mm, I, I, I don't know. But, um, and I, I think that's where a lot of the critics are coming from to this. I mean, once you, like, once I read this and like really thought about it, I mean, the legal stuff aside, I mean, so all the parties involved in this, uh, Russia, the US, Ukraine aren't signatories to the Convention on Cluster Munitions that sort of ban its use. And the countries that these arms are expected to flow through, Mm. so Poland and Bulgaria, Mm. I Mm. think, aren't signatories to it either. So legally, none of it, I mean, morally should apply. I don't know. But legally, it doesn't. Um, You know, you can't violate a convention that you're not you're not party to. I mean, yeah, I, I, I think the use case for it is is very strong. I mean, we're sort of seeing now that like the Ukrainian counteroffensive isn't isn't making as much gains as as they would have hoped. And, you know, like these you, uh, Russian troops are dug in in the east and like there's three successive lines of defenses, 30 kilometers of complex minefields, tank obstacles, uh, extensive trench lines covered by UAVs, artillery, and and helicopters. So I think that's what these munitions are are meant to break through, especially uh, the Russians that are bogged down in these in these trenches. You know, like you sort of made the point, like the artillery and stuff. Like conventional artillery can't quite get in there. Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think it was a very good point that. I, I think one of the one of the concerns of the use of of cluster munitions is that you know a lot of it these you know bomblets I guess will remain unexploded and they'll kind of get sort of into these like farming fields and stuff and then after the war you know like a kid will go through and pick it up and you know like blow them apart. Um, but that's true of any any munitions. I mean, there's tons of of, of artillery shells and stuff that don't that don't uh, explode. I mean, there's been um, parts of France and Belgium where they found unexploded ordnance from World War One. You know, hundred years, a hundred years later, that are still uh, that are still dangerous. You know, and EOD squads have to come out and and render it render it safe. So, I mean. After this war is over, uh, whenever that comes, I mean, a lot of, a lot of huge swaths of the Ukrainian countryside in the east, especially. Um, I mean, they're going to have these issues of of unexploded ordnance and stuff uh, that are going to be dealing with for for years. And will you have cases of you know civilians, kids, unfortunately coming across this stuff and getting hurt? Yeah, I mean, it sucks, but that's that's war, and it's going to happen. Um, and, uh, I mean, yeah, after this is over, there's going to be, a have to be a big effort to kind of, I think demilitarize is the right term, but you know what yeah, I mean, kind yeah, of go through and things. clear these yeah. areas as best you yeah. can. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, so I'm, I'm fine with it for that, for that reason. I mean, I think like the Ukrainians definitely aren't going to use it against civilian targets. I mean, that's just, that's just not what they're going to use it for. I, I, I think my point is, if you're criticizing this decision, 
but you don't have a word to say, you haven't had a word to say about Russia's conduct of the war thus far, about the 200,000 Ukrainian children that they've kidnapped mm, and have done mm. God knows what with. Like, I don't want to hear shit from you about mm. this. You know, um, it's very kind of selective yeah. outrage that you see. Yeah, yeah, it does seem a lot of selective outrage over this, because I believe, I could be wrong here, but I do believe Russia have already used cluster munitions in Ukraine. I'm oh, yeah. Sure they have. Um, so, you know, there is a bit of hypocrisy on that front. Just to explain to all its members, just in case you're not familiar with how cluster munitions work. So um, they're fired like a normal artillery shell. And within them are 72 to 88 smaller munitions. And each one of these smaller munitions acts like a kind of individual grenade. And they explode in the air over a target, which scatters those munitions over a range of 400 meters. Western cluster bombs apparently have a failure rate of 2% in comparison to Russian ones that have a failure rate of 40%. So what that means is the, that, that that's the percentage of unexploded munitions that will lie around after the fact. Um, so obviously this is where the concern for things comes from um you know because these things can as you've been saying stay undetected for years and sadly typically it's children who tend to to find these things um so i mean at least with the u.s nato munitions there is a lower failure rate um and the ukrainians mm -hmm. do apparently have recovery plans in place um and they've said they will not use them against civilians so it's not like it's not like the way russia are just indiscriminately using them or could use them and it's not like ukraine is saying we're gonna you know bomb moscow with cluster bombs and stuff like because i would be concerned if that was going to be the case i wasn't crazy about the drones attacking apartment buildings no. in moscow i mean i understand there were supposedly intelligence officers that were mm. living in there but mm. People who see that shit on TV don't know that. They just see drones attacking apartment buildings. Well, exactly. I think this is where the line will get crossed. And I think this is where maybe, I mean, I, I honestly, like everybody, I hope this war ends tomorrow. It's not going to. It's probably going to drag on. I, I suspect, I could be wrong here, and I'm not wishing this, but I suspect this war is probably going to drag on for a few years. Um, and, I mean, I'm already actually seeing in, in London there's a lot less... Um, obvious support for Ukraine than there was a year ago. I've seen a lot of places where there were flags have gone. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of big buildings um, around London used to have the Ukrainian colours on them. That's gone. Um, and in fact, I was on a, a boat not long ago. There's a set of boats just near Tower Bridge. That every single one of them had a Ukrainian flag on this time last year. None of them have them on anymore. Um, so I don't know what that all means but i do get the feeling that from a you know western perspective there is a bit of war fatigue kicking in which is a luxury position to be in i might add i mean you know for us here getting a bit bored of this war and in fact i took a friend to task about a similar comment not long ago where i was like oh i'm bored of this I was like well fucking hell man you're not even fighting in it for fuck's sakes you know it's not a fucking tv series no exactly and you I'm, know I, honestly yeah yeah people do have very strange opinions on this whole thing so it's it's just like fucking hell you know people are dying every day in this this bloody thing um yeah so uh i lost my trail of thought there but i think you know we've got to be careful about this sort of um waning sort of support for ukraine so um yeah i think that like you've been saying there is some selective outrage about all this um because where was human rights watch campaigning against russia's use of weapons against ukrainian civilians i've personally not seen it where was it why is it every time the west do something there's outrage um you know it just seems a bit one-sided i mean the usual suspects like the stop the war coalition and people like that um so you know i i i, I you know i'm used to seeing that kind of stuff from them um and yeah. they're sort of weird sort of slightly pro-russia thing partly for nostalgia from the past um partly because i don't know some of them actively still think russia will be better than the west um is is a very weird one like you were saying earlier when i first heard about it i was a bit concerned about these use of cluster munitions it was sort of like um i don't know i i, I in my mind i was seeing images of white phosphorus actually not cluster bombs but yeah that was sort of like the thing that came to, and, and obviously the terrible use of it in iraq and stuff and i thought oh this is not good um yeah. and then like you when reading a bit about it and suddenly realizing um it's not as straightforward as as people make it out to be and in fact these weapons could be very effective and and um you know so for every one of these they're probably saving an awful lot of conventional munitions aren't they yeah the way i look at it there's a specific need for these specific weapons to hit Russian troops down in these trenches 
that other conventional munitions can't get to. I mean, yes, there's a concern about unexploded ordnance. That's already a concern and would be a concern regardless of whether or not these munitions are used. The parties involved are not subject to this convention outlawing their use. Um, uh, uh, yeah, okay, it's it, it's messy, but mm. that's that's war. And Russia could negate the need for all mm. of this if they just left mm. Ukraine. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what they should be campaigning for, especially Human Rights Watch. Yeah. I've just remembered my point. So um, one of the things that I think, if this war does drag on for many years, I suspect it might, the worrying thing is when the line that will be crossed for me personally is it's more just when you start getting like low level, maybe terror attacks against civilians, like bombs on buses and things like that. If the Ukrainians started resorting to that, that would be for me personally a red line and I'm not saying they're going to do this by the way but I'm just saying if that became a tactic down the line that would be kind of where for me personally I'd probably jump off the Ukrainian train there's a there's a difference between insurgency and terrorism yeah and I think it comes down to the targets that you hit you know like these mysterious fires in Russia for industrial facilities go nuts don't yeah. care yeah but yeah if you're just going to start attack if you're just going to start lashing out out of just rage regardless of kind of thought behind it which is why i mean honestly what we found out about the Nord Stream bombing mm. gives me pause mm. um a couple of weeks ago when they like i said when there was those attacks on those apartment buildings in moscow i didn't like that no um no and yeah. it gets into a very icky territory and, when, and if they start doing that it makes it harder to support that cause because then suddenly yeah i just it's bit this where i think the palestinian courts went wrong personally um, yeah. and this is why i find because we're gonna talk about mossad later and it's been on my mind today is i always like what do i really feel about israel palestine and i find it very difficult to really answer that because there's no perfect answer because i have sympathy for israel and I have sympathy for the palestinian cause but for me personally when i started learning about black september and read about the munich olympics that's kind of where for me personally i kind of jumped off the Palestinian train, so to speak. I found that quite abhorrent, especially when you look into the details of how some of the individual athletes were treated and one was castrated. Um, yep. And and obviously, you know, with then targeting civilians across Europe in the 70s and 80s through the PLO and, and Black September, that for me is my fear that this could turn into that if we're not careful in the long run. And I don't, I'm, you know, I'm just speculating there of the Ukrainian situation. I hope to God it never gets to that. But that's what worries me a little bit obviously every you know we're just speculating here so so that was my my uh kind of point there um uh about the the if this conflict kind of drags on and on the more along it goes the more desperate you get did you see what ben wallace said this this morning or or this or this afternoon to you oh i didn't actually know because i've been so busy preparing for this i haven't even looked at the bbc today what did he say what did so say? this is uh so this happened mm. at the nato summit yeah uh which was like wrapping up like right now mm. um so this was tweeted by deborah haynes she's a security and defense editor at sky um and uh she says, uh, so I guess Ben Wallace uh, said this, the UK is not an Amazon delivery service for weapons to Ukraine, and Kiev might be wise to let its supporters seek gratitude, mm. Britain's Defense Secretary Ben Wallace had said. In a blunt intervention, Mr. Wallace said his counsel to the Ukrainians was to keep in mind that they need to persuade some doubting politicians in Washington and other capitals that the tens of billions of pounds they are spending in military aid to their country for its war with Russia is worthwhile. He was responding to a question from Sky News about whether the failure of allies to give President Zelensky a time frame for membership to NATO at a major summit this week would undermine the morale of his troops on the front lines. Mm. How do you how do you feel about that? Yeah, it kind of remind when you, just you said that it kind of reminded me of the alleged bust up between Biden and um, Zelensky about a year ago, where Biden said to him yeah. he needs to express more gratitude for what support it's they the same have thing. got. Yeah, I think there is a sense sometimes when Ukraine keeps saying "Give me, give me, we need this, we need that, we need that," that there is a sense of. Um, ungratefulness for what they have got but at the same time yeah they're fighting for their lives you know it's it's yeah yeah i i really i really struggle with that um i i, I tend to really want to and do give the ukrainians the benefit of the doubt i mean yeah like they're they're in a struggle for their very existence you know like against an enemy that like 
is just outright saying that like the Ukrainian existence is like an aberration mm, of history, mm, mm. you know? Um, so I think, you know, how would, how would we respond to if we're being attacked in that situation? And I, I, I get it, you know, I, I, I um, I, I, I don't know. I think it's the debate sometimes gets really toxic and I think it, it's honestly done by, uh, a lot of well-intentioned supporters of Ukraine in the West that have sort of taken the stance that like, if there's any sort of pause at all to consider, like, I mean, we're giving the Ukrainians really advanced, like F-16s, yeah. stuff that, that even a short time ago would just seem like insane to yeah. use it to kill Russian soldiers. Yeah. But there's a there's a very kind of toxic thread that's gotten in this debate that any kind of pause moment to consider, like, should we be doing this? Is this the best way to do it is to mean that, like, you somehow, like, support the genocide of Ukrainians, yeah. which is just an insane yeah. argument. It is. You know, it is. Um, it is. Well, yeah. Why don't we segue into this NATO membership thing a minute, and then sure. uh, let me just <laughs> just fast forward to that section. Yeah, I mean, I'll just summarise some key points then um, from a BBC article from the NATO summit about the Allies refuse to give Ukraine a time frame for joining, and I think that will fill into what we're talking about here. So I'll just quickly outline those key points, and I'll come back to you for your thoughts, and we'll carry on with this. Mm -hmm. So um, NATO member states have stated that Ukraine can join a military alliance with certain conditions, when certain conditions conditions are met, responding to President Zelensky's criticism of the delay in their membership. While NATO recognises the need to expedite the process, no specific time frame has been provided. Zelensky has expressed frustration at the perceived lack of readiness to invite Ukraine to join NATO. While Ukraine acknowledges that it cannot join while at war with Russia, it aims to become a member as soon as possible after the war ends. And then the NATO chief, uh, Jens Stolenberg, has announced that the membership process for Ukraine would change from a two-step to a one-step process, removing the need for a formal membership action plan. So that's something. Um, however, Zelensky's voice concerned that the absence of an agreed time frame potentially makes Ukrainian membership a bargaining chip in future negotiations with Russia. So, yeah, I mean, Matt, what are your thoughts and all this i think this is probably the best way forward i mean i think ukraine arguably fields the most capable army on the continent right now and i think has earned its right to be in nato more than several western european countries that are currently in nato right now if i'm being honest um that said i don't see how they join until this war is very mm. much over mm. i mean so it was it was it was apparently very clear within the debate within nato that the invitation to join wouldn't then like they, they they wouldn't join until the war is over right which i think one a lot of the reporting around this was not helpful because it doesn't make that clear like you just see a headline you know like nato to invite uh ukraine to join and then you have people like elon moss coming out and saying like that's going to be world war three like so so not making it clear that the invitation to join doesn't necessarily doesn't mean that they would join while the war is still ongoing mm. because then you would have nato in a war with yeah yeah it'd be article five and, and that's why yes you know, yeah and that's why they're saying no until the war is over you know yeah so i guess the disagreement leading into this was that if nato would be if if nato would give ukraine a timeline like we want you in the alliance by this point. And I think uh they said um they would they would uh get rid of the 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 need for Ukraine to have like a membership action plan which yeah. would like delay it yeah. longer. Yeah. Um the disagreement though was that Zelensky was saying that without a timeline uh it it could make Ukraine's membership in NATO a bargaining chip in 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 negotiations my feeling with that towards it i guess is if you put down a timeline of we want if if Ukraine isn't going to join NATO until this war is very much over and you put a timeline down saying we want Ukraine and NATO by this point you're essentially putting a timeline down of when you expect this war to end. Well, yeah, you can't put a timeline down of something that you hasn't can't... concluded yet, really. No, I mean, to your point, I mean, this could easily freeze 
you know, into sort of just just a stalemate in the East. It's kind of already there and drag on for another five years. You know, you can't really predict how this is going to um, end. So I I don't know. I would like to hear more about the the pro timeline mm-hmm. crowd, like mm-hmm. why they why they would feel that that's a good well, thing, regardless yeah. of us not knowing when the war is going to end. I don't I don't have an answer for the that. The only thing I've read that kind of gives some indication of what the thinking is, and I'll just find my notes, that it's um, it's to do with showing support for Ukraine. Um, you know, some people seem to think that it's symbolic, that if you, you know, and, and this particular lack of timeline is a bit of a blow symbolically because um, some sort of commitment would be seen that the Western order, for lack of a better term, has faith in Ukraine and its efforts of fighting off Russian aggression is from what I saw um, earlier today um, as one of the sort of kind of key points from the pro timeline kind of crowd. Um, the thing is, I think NATO has every right to be cautious. If I was the head of NATO, I'd yeah. be cautious because the thing is, and, and uh, you know, people are going to think I'm being hyperbolic here, but um, if NATO gets in somehow dragged into a direct conflict with Russia, um, that leads to nuclear war, most likely, and and only two percent of the world population would survive a full blown nuclear exchange. Let's not forget that. Um, it, you know, it is a bit hyperbolic, but I think NATO always are bearing that in mind. And so, you know, there are some people who seem to think, you know, we need to get Ukraine into NATO now. That's not going to happen. And you can't put a timeline on something where you don't know the conclusion. Because the thing is, the war, when this war does end, which I again hopes sooner rather than later, we don't know, A, who the president of Ukraine is going to be. With B, we're not going to know what state ukraine's going to be in um see you don't know what the regime in charge of ukraine's going to be any longer um there's so many variables so is so if you then say one year after the victory against russia that you automatically come into nato i think that sets up a problem because also um yeah i mean i could just foresee there are lots of issues there because there's too many unknowns to your to your point about you know it, it being I guess people would say that that extending the timeline is a is a is a it would be a yeah a, a symbolic measure of support for Ukraine. I mean, okay, but does that make sense to do logically based on the conditions on the ground? You know, what is that? What does that get us? And okay, what about the what about the cluster munitions and the cruise missiles and the F 16s that we're providing to mm. the Ukrainians? Is that not a symbolic show of our support? Exactly, exactly. And this is, I I think. I think this whole NATO membership thing has um, it's become a bit of a is distraction. The right word, I don't know. It's become a bit of a badge that they seem to want to wear, and they've invested a bit. I think the Ukrainians have invested a bit too much into this NATO membership thing. For now, I think in the long run, yes, but I I think they've absolutely earned it. Like I said, they deserve to be in NATO more than some countries of Western Europe that have been in there since the fifties. Yes, right. And I mean, like to the classic, you know, oh, well, if Ukraine, you know, it's going to piss off the Russians if mm. if, if Ukraine joins NATO, what are they going to do? They're going to invade? Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like their leverage is kind of shot. Mm. But I, I think this is something that that reasonable people could come to different opinions and and disagree on it. Um I I think if if is it safe to say like okay like if 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 you're listening to this and you have a different perspective on this like maybe send us an email and tell us what you think yeah and like is that is that fair yeah yeah secrets of spies at gmail dot com you know just to avoid a one star review I mean I will just make yeah completely crystal clear I do want Ukraine and NATO and I think yes. you have every right to be in it. I just sadly, realistically, don't think a it's not going to happen now because of the Article Five concern, and b right. I just think it's very difficult to put a commitment on something you don't know how it concludes. It's sort of like right. uh, trying to write the sequel of a film you don't know the ending of yet. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a very simplistic way of putting yeah. it, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I think Ukraine has absolutely earned its right to be a NATO. Mm. I think it ultimately should be a NATO. Mm. I don't think it can be until this war is over. No. And I think the difficulty of putting a timeline on their membership mm. is you don't you have no really control or idea of when this war is going to end. Yeah, that's yeah. my yeah. That's I, I think what we're saying. Yeah, here. yeah. And I think Ukraine might be wiser just putting its energies on just there, you know. It, 
basically campaigning for just more physical logistical support and thanking people for their logistical support too just in in regard to ben wallace's comments just uh you mentioned earlier just to make it clear that they are grateful for those that support they're getting yeah i think something a lot of people don't really consider is a country joining nato it's not simply like okay you're in or you're out i mean before like to to operate within the alliance for, for I mean yes Ukraine in in the last year and a half or so has gotten tons of advanced Western weaponry has has learned to use it effectively before that not that long ago they were essentially just like a remnant Soviet yeah force yeah look at their weaponry you know so you yeah. think like okay so if for a country to join NATO uh, that involves I mean if you look at like the back end of what NATO does, I mean, it's, it's integration about like radio frequencies Mm. and, and combined arms doctrine, uh, training Mm. integration on, on weapon systems, uh, satellite communications. There's all exactly down to the the magazine that goes in the gun, you know, it would be compatible. Yeah. All kinds of stuff that basically just makes it so that these armies, that these different countries, these armed forces, of different countries can operate together seamlessly. And that takes that takes a lot of time for for countries to get to that point. I mean, I think Sweden, Finland too, but Sweden especially was kind of a separate case because they've been an advanced Westernized military for you know since the end of World War II essentially. You know, so mm. it wasn't that big of a jump. Mm. Yeah, yeah. NATO membership, obviously, uh, it, you know, its aim is to make sure everybody's compatible in some terrible scenario that Russia or China or whoever you know, tries to mount an invasion against their members. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I can understand why once one wants to be in a club. And obviously I totally agree with and understand um, the points that were made that, you know, Ukraine probably should have been in NATO earlier um, and probably should not have given up their nuclear weapons when they did in the nineties. It's all sorts of past mistakes and misjudgments that have been made. And obviously people well. are concerned about Russia's, um, you know, perceived um, NATO encroachment. Yeah, so uh, there were people in the 90s, I think, had the best of intentions, but some of those things have not quite panned out so well, for Ukraine at least. I mean, I, I've seen some people on Twitter, you know, people mm. whose opinions I respect say to the point of the of extending NATO the timeline, uh, to extending Ukraine the timeline to join NATO, that, well, if if NATO was, if if Ukraine was in NATO, you know, two years ago, the Russians never would have, mm. never would have invaded. Maybe, mm. but they weren't, mm. and they did get invaded, and now we're in a war, mm. and we have to go through that mm. until we move forward. You know, um, yeah. I don't know if, if there's if 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 you're listening to this and you have a different perspective, something that that we're not seeing, you know. Write us and tell us. I would like to hear it. Secrets and Spies podcast at gmail.com. Cool. Well, we'll take a quick commercial break and come back. Alphabet Boys is a podcast that takes you inside undercover investigations. In the second season, we've got an alphabet soup with the DEA, the CIA, and the FBI all mixed up in the same case. So you do personal security all over the world, and you had somebody call you and say, can you get grenades and guns for this guy in Colombia? Not, not specifically. It's a mystery wrapped around an international arms deal. Listen to Alphabet Boys, wherever you get your podcasts. Just before we get back to the last section of the show, I'd like to just take a moment to talk with you about Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN service that allows you to protect your privacy online. And I don't know about you, but I'm always on the move and I'm very reliant on public Wi-Fi. And sadly, public Wi-Fi is notoriously insecure and it puts your data at risk. And I've now started to use Surfshark to protect me when I'm on public Wi-Fi. I contacted Surfshark and we now have a special offer just for you where you get 83% off when you sign up and you also get three months for free. So to get access to this offer, please use our special code, which is the word secrets. Just use the word secrets at the register and you'll get access to that offer. I've put a link in the show notes below, so it's very easy. Just click on that link and follow it all from there. So anyway, I hope that's helpful for you and let's get back to the show. (music) 
Right, welcome back, everybody. So um, we're now going to take a look at, or another look at this uh, attempted mutiny or whatever it was that happened in Russia on the 23rd of June and lasted 24 hours. So um, according to a piece in the New York Times by Paul Son, Yegevny Prigozhin has actually had a meeting with Vladimir Putin since the mutiny. Um, and I'm just going to summarize a few key points for his article and then Matt will come to you. Um so Russian President Vladimir Putin recently held a meeting with Yegevny Prigozhin, who was the who is the leader of the or was the leader, still unsure about that, of the Wagner private military group or company. Um, and this is just days after the group's failed mutiny. And the meeting was attended by top commanders of Wagner and they discussed the group's future and potential employment options. So there we go. <laughs> what an interesting topic there. Um, and while the details of the agreement reached during the meeting remain unclear, it is notable that the Wagner officials were able to meet peacefully with Putin and pledge their loyalty to him, despite being denounced as traitors. So this highlights Prigozhin's influence and suggests that the Kremlin sees keeping the mercenaries within its control as pre a preferable alternative to them becoming an armed opposition. However, Putin's leniency towards Wagner could face backlash from the defense ministry, which was the main target of the mutiny. The Wagner mercenaries had briefly seized the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don and the military headquarters before embarking on a march toward Moscow. Despite Putin's strong denunciation of the uprising, a deal was uh, reportedly brokered by the Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko, allowing Prigozhin to avoid prosecution execution and leave for Belarus whilst the uh, participating mercenaries face no punishment. The agreement sparked outrage among some commentators as it meant no consequences for the insurrectionists who had shot down Russian aircraft and killed air crew. The Kremlin has provided conflicting information about Prokosian's whereabouts, initially claiming ignorance and then denying the ability to track him and then later confirming the meeting with Putin but withholding any further details. So a very Russian ending there. So Matt, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on, on this surprising development. <laughs> so Russian security forces of some kind recently mm. raided, I think, Prigozhin's house in mm. St. Petersburg oh, yes, and yes. found like this big stash of like gold <laughs> bars and a bunch of wigs and stuff that oh, used for disguises, great, yeah. which is weird. But I was thinking of like Prigozhin telling like all his Wagner goons, mm. like I'm just mm. going over to the Kremlin to get closure with like Putin. And it's like, okay. And then he comes back and one of his wigs is all like disheveled. I don't know. That's a that's a mental image. You'll never get out of your head. Those, those did you see those wig pictures of him? Yeah, supposedly, I wasn't yeah, sure there was AI or yeah. not. But they were hilarious. It was like unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what to make of this. It seems. Mm. I mean, I think the key point there is like, uh, yeah, like they want the mercenaries. They want these mercenaries like in the tent mm. rather than aggrieved and outside mm. the tent. I mean, like when there are reports of like you know. They're building camps for Wagner in in Belarus. I was just thinking, like, this is it. Just seems like a bad idea. I, I mean, like, Putin's already violated like the first lesson of dictator one hundred and one, which is like you don't let anyone challenge your monopoly on violence. You know, and like he already Putin's already failed that just by allowing Wagner to get to this point. But it, it's very strange the change in intact how how putin has dealt with this like so during during the mutiny and immediately after like yeah like he called he called Prigozhin like a traitor and and well refused for a while refused to use Prigozhin's name which is a tactic putin's used before like he's refused to use zelensky's name refers to him like obliquely and stuff which i think just is tries to push this idea that like he's a czar and he's so far above all this stuff and he doesn't he doesn't he wouldn't sully himself with these kind of petty, petty issues. Um, but now he's meeting with with Prigos and you know it's 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 a strange twist. Um, you know, there's there's a lot going on that that we definitely don't know about right now. There's you know the stories about like Sergei uh, Surovikin, who um, was this general who I guess knew about the mutiny beforehand or was in cahoots with Prigozhin to to some extent he's been disappeared and is rumored to be in the fort of a prison right now um but you know Prigozhin's meeting with with Putin it's very strange i think my gut tells me if anything it it shows that Putin knows that uh Wagner could be a very 
big annoyance for him. And mm. so, yeah, it, it's better to have them inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. Totally, yeah. My first note here was, it's a case of the better the devil you know and keeping your enemies close to you and i think that's the case right. because i think we, like we were saying in the previous episode that wagner is pretty much the elite of russian special forces so logistically to roll oh, yeah. all that up that must be quite a complicated thing um and on top of that as as you said you know, putin doesn't want that force against him either so he's i mean i still don't know what the fate of prigozhin is going to be because i still think that um you know, there was some things kind of going on there. I mean, there are there are a few, lots of ways to consider this because we I, we did talk in the last episode about whether this mutiny was a phony um, and an attempt to test loyalties and flush out would be plotters against Putin. I'm still I think it was too elaborate for that, um, but at the same yeah. time, there's still this sort of like, well, I don't know, it, it could have happened. Um, you know, and I think last time we said we suspected Prigozhin took things a little bit too far, a bit like Boris Johnson and Brexit. Um, and he was not expecting things to kind of go the way that they did. Um, and this sort of mutiny has kind of come at the cost of making Putin look weak. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's a very, very interesting one. Um, and, yeah, I think I wonder if Putin does see Prigozhin as a as a legitimate threat to his leadership in some way. Because uh, like we said before, like Prigozhin is this sort of, uh, I mean, is he a war hero? But he could be perceived as a war hero because he's certainly fighting on the front line in Ukraine. And he's been recently very critical of the war very carefully blaming it all on the defense ministry not putin himself um other than a few remarks about um what was he called putin a grandfather or something i can't remember what he said now yeah that's uh, the yeah. way that that's the way that a lot of people in the russian elite circles referred mm. and i think just russian society as a whole how they refer to putin as mm. like grandfather mm. that's a way mm. that you know like the father of the nation or something that's a that's a common way that he's referred to over there yeah yeah and russian state media has been doing all that can to discredit Prigozhin. so again I, to me that indicates putin and his cronies are fearful of Prigozhin. Because if Russian state media is against you, then it probably means that they want to kind of discredit you as much as possible in the public eye. Um, and it could be, and I'll call it these peace and reconciliation efforts, um, could be just to buy Putin some time to placate Prigozhin or get rid of him, uh, possibly on the battlefield or by some other popular methods like a window or poisoning. So Prigozhin, I still think, could uh, his number could be up. Um, and, yeah. um, you know, we are living in interesting times of Russia at the moment. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I'll just segue quickly into our final article of Espresso Martini today. So, um, just adding some insight on events in Russia, CIA director William Burns has said that the armed mutiny has shown the damage Putin has done to Russia itself. Um, and I'll just summarize his comments, and these are taken from a Yahoo News article by Guy Falconbridge, um, and it's just titled, CIA Burns, Armed Mutiny Shows Damage Putin Has Done to Russia. So the key points are, so CIA Director William Burns has described Yevgeny Prigozhin's armed mutiny as a challenge to the Russian state, highlighting the corrosive effect of President Putin's war in Ukraine. Prigozhin openly insulted top Russian military officials, criticizing their conduct of the war, which went unanswered publicly by Putin. Burns sees the mutiny as a consequence of Putin's war and views it as an armed challenge to the Russian state. He emphasized that the United States had no involvement in the internal affair because I think Russian state media and certainly certain members of the Russian government claimed that the CIA had somehow been responsible for this. And despite projecting calm after the mutiny resolved, Burns argues that the Russians' war in Ukraine has been a strategic failure exposing its military weaknesses and causing long-term damage to their economy. He suggests that Russia's future could be one of becoming a junior partner, an economic colony of China due to Putin's mistakes. Um, and Burns also notes that the disaffection with the war in Ukraine presents an opportunity for the CIA to recruit spies as Russian citizens have become increasingly disillusioned with state propaganda and repression. And in May, uh, the Kremlin claimed to be monitoring Western spy activity following the CIA's video encouraging Russians to share information through a secure channel. Burns affirms that the CIA will not waste this once-in-a-generation opportunity to recruit agents amid the dissatisfaction with in Russia caused by the war. So Matt, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on um, Director Burns's comments there. I think when Bill Burns says something about 
a- anything about the Russians publicly, I think it's definitely worth listening to. Mm. I mean, he's probably the most seasoned expert on Russia in yeah. in in the federal government, um, and I think it's really valuable. That he's director of the CIA right now. Um, I mean, he was he was ambassador to Russia for a good chunk of. The Bush administration, he was the number third and number two position in the State Department for a good chunks of the Obama administration um, and was was present in a lot of these meetings with Putin going back. So and like when he when he says something publicly, it it's it, it's there's a reason for it. Um, I I think his point, uh, you know, that because of this war, like Russia's future is basically as a junior partner and economic colony of China. Um I think that's probably exactly where this goes, no matter how the war ends. Um, I think it's probably pretty dangerous to to see Russia as sort of like a vassal to to, to the Chinese. Yeah, yeah. Well, as as Burns mentioned, this is potentially boon time for the recruitment of Russian spies by the CIA, SIS, and other Western sure. services. Um, I, I do wonder how the CIA is faring on the recruitment front post Trump, uh, because I think we mentioned this on Extra Shot. I think it was a few months back um, that Trump's behavior in office, um, in which he exposed the existence of a deep of deep cover assets through his careless comments. I do wonder if that makes it harder for the CIA and American intelligence um, sort of less a less appealing option for would be Russian assets. Um, so I'd love to be like, uh, you know, listening in on those conversations yeah. between case officers and potential Russian recruits at the moment. Um, and I do wonder whether that might be other Western intelligence services might be benefiting from it, like the French or the Danish, maybe even the British. I'm not sure. But um, certainly America is only, I think, started to kind of get its reputation back of stability um, only in this last of, or probably since the war in Ukraine, really, because um just talking from a kind of British stroke European perspective, you know, America's reputation was in tatters um, and seen as a very unreliable partner when Trump was in office. And, and, um, and I think it must make it very hard for would-be recruits to want to put their life on the line for the CIA um, only to find the president somehow exposes that you exist in some way. So I think that would be very interesting. Um, and apparently the CIA's open recruitment video targeting Russians online has had over 2.5 million views. What that equates to, I'm uncertain because... They're certainly not a major hit in online terms, but I mean, maybe those 2.5 million views are in Russia. I don't know. Director Burns mentioned it in his speech that we'll talk about in the next, yeah. uh, in, in extra shot. Um, Burns' comments also confirm our comments earlier that this mutiny has exposed Putin's weakness um, and his grip on power. I said this last time, and I'll say it again, that Putin's face is of his own making. In democracies, former presidents and leaders retire. In dictatorships, they die in office or are deposed by an armed opposition. And I have to ask, is it worth it? Is it worth that That. And uh, I, I just, you know, it's really reaffirmed my sort of belief in democracy is the best political option that we have in an imperfect world. And I do find it interesting that we now live in an age where, you know, you and I on this podcast have been labelled as pro-democracy as a point to be considered or debated. I find that quite interesting. So, uh, you know, I will put my flag up and say, yeah, I'm very much pro-democracy. And seeing events like that just further further my, uh, my sort of admiration for democracy. So. I think your point there at like, you know, democracies end with, you know, the leader is defeated in an election or they or they choose to step down. Whereas in dictatorships, yeah, they're either they're killed or they die in office. Um or they go to prison. You know, I, I, I think if if anything, the to that point, I think this mutiny kind of shows we, we talked about this a bit before this mutiny kind of shows, I guess, the level of apathy inside Russian society and how yeah. they just don't consider they don't consider political events that occur mm, mm. In, in in the same way that we do. You know, I mean, mm, I think there's mm. this like romanticized notion that, you know, the Russians are going to rise up and they're going to, you know, uh, elect some kind of, you know, Western Navalny esque figure. Hey, I don't think there's I mean. Navalny's pretty much done. I mean, he's an inspiring figure, but he was, it's, um, I, I, they just look at it differently. I, I think, you know, in the aftermath in that mutiny, they saw, okay, well, the guy who executes people with sledgehammers isn't in charge of us 
okay, great, cool. Like, let's, let's move on. There's just sort of like an idea that like, okay, well, we're not good. We're not being massacred right now. Like this, this isn't, you know, we're not taking the hits here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's, let's, you know, like that's enough for them. Yeah. 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 Well, I had a, had a brief conversation with a colleague and a friend of mine who's a bit more of a Russia expert than I am. Um, and one of the points he made which maybe flies in the face of something i said in the previous episode but um you know he was saying that russian citizens are naturally very cautious about being openly political because of their history because they kind of would rather see where the wind's blowing and then put their allegiances because obviously with russia's history you know there's been quite a few uprisings um in uh, uh, and, and purges in their history and so yeah, you can understand why there's caution. I mean, I know if I lived in a situation like that, I'd, you know, we wouldn't be a, having a podcast like this, would we? But no. uh, we'd be bloody cautious, you know. I'd be very careful, you you know, because if it's if your neck faces the chop because you made a mistake of supporting Prigozhin or something, I can understand that reluctance. So I don't, I certainly don't look at um, Russian people or citizens as being kind of weak because of that. I understand that entirely. Um but it, and it, and it's just very sad that Putin's kind of created an environment where, you know, people have to live in such a way. Um, and I do put it completely on Putin's shoulders. I think that there have, there's always a alternative choice. I know people talk about Russia like strong men, etc. Maybe that's true, but it's like um, I still th- I always think, and there are Russians who have said this that there are alternative ways to run things and i think that you know maybe once this dreadful war does conclude and i hope it concludes with a russian loss in ukraine victory um just to make that clear um i think that uh i'm hoping that whoever takes over obviously i think it's likely whoever takes over from russia from putin is going to be to the right of putin from everything i've seen and read and people i've spoken to that clearly is likely to be the case um but i hope maybe that um that maybe somehow that whoever that new leader is they will be sensible and see that that um going this way is not the best option in the long run um and the short-term gains and stuff are are not really going to pay out in their favor and it's usually better to kind of cooperate and sort of uh, find a way to be a part of the international order because i think that's where there have been some failures and i know the west has certainly um were a bit reluctant to include putin in those early years in some of the kind of um western order if we put it that way and i think putin got slightly ignored a little bit in the early part of his leadership um and i think there's definitely been some mistakes on the west part with dealing with putin in the early years um but you know putin sort of been thriving off this sort of nato versus russia rhetoric and it's just complete bollocks um and i would like to see the end of that somehow um and uh, and i hope for russia's sake that that nonsense does come to a conclusion and somehow um you know in time once there's been some sort of proper reparations and justice for the war that russia somehow find a way into the international community um and sort of become a partner rather than um, a potential antagonist so uh, <laughs> that's me trying to put the world to rights there but anyway. well mm. you know i mean you you were just talking about i i i if you look at russia's place throughout history i mean going back to like catherine the great and stuff moving forward i, I mean russia has been kind of amongst a handful of nations that have just kind of always been a a major force not just in europe but the whole world and you think a country of that size with its vastness and its history its 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 natural resources russia should be a global power i mean it, it it's one of those but you have to act like it you know and which is what's kind of so frustrating about this like we're sort of in this invasion we're in this situation because russia's pissed off that it's not it's not a global power and that it's not seen or respected as a global power. Mm. Okay, then act like one. Mm. You yeah, know? they're kind of acting a bit like North Korea a little bit, aren't they, with all this? Yeah. Sort of, I feel like they feel yeah. like they're getting left out and they have to fire a missile or something every few months. <laughs> right. I mean, it's kind of, yeah, like responsible world powers mm. don't kidnap 200,000 
uh, Ukrainian children mm. and ship them off to God knows where in Siberia to do God knows what, mm. you know? Mm. And poison and shoot critics and so on. Right, responsible yeah. world powers don't just essentially run their government as a mafia state to enrich, to, yeah, in, in enrich its rulers at the expense of uh, not having an effective armed forces to to wage the genocidal war of conquest that they're trying to, you know, the Russians would be much more effective at this war if they weren't so fucking corrupt. Mm. Indeed. You know, Indeed. if if all the years of of military modernization of all those efforts, if that money just wasn't went to what it was actually supposed to do and wasn't just skinned off the top for, you know, yachts and stuff, yeah, they'd be in a much much better situation, which if you see the Chinese, they had this problem a couple years ago and they cracked down on it. This issue of, of corruption, they cracked down on it hard. Mm. Mm, they did. They did. And it's the thing. I mean, this is the maybe the slightly scary thing is whoever po uh, Putin 2.0, whoever that will be. Um, they might well do a crackdown and maybe in 10 years time or 20 years time will face another crisis like the Ukraine one, but this time they might be better equipped, better trained. And, and this is what, that's the other concern I have because it's like, you know, like we talk about Weimar Republic and stuff. I don't want Russia to just turn into, you know, the next batch, the third Reich, whatever, and, and, you know, fight another war in 10, 20 years time and win it. I time. saw that possibility with, I saw that possibility with Prigozhin that kind of populist, nationalist, militaristic streak that was just coming out and saying, like, you know, Shoigu Gerasimov, like, you're all corrupt and feckless, and that's why we're losing, and we suck at this war. I mean, speaking truth to power, he was he was correct about that. But that kind of mentality is then pretty dangerous, mm. arguably more dangerous than, than, than mm. the status quo. Yeah, indeed. And indeed, interestingly, from history, some of the people who wanted, within the Nazi ranks, who wanted to kill Hitler, it wasn't because they wanted the war to end, but they just felt like Hitler was so ineffective in the war that they needed to kill him, to get him out of the way, to get somebody in who could do it, run it better. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that annoyed me about the film Valkyrie, actually, was they kind of played that down and tried to make them understandable and nice Nazis. It's like, ah, right. they're Nazis, you know. Uh, well, that's yeah. like, you know, what we said in the in the right after the mutiny, you mm. know, when the, when those Russians were out on the street in, in Rostov cheering mm -hmm. on the Wagner fighters who were, yeah. who were leaving the city. Like, what are they cheering for? Are they cheering yeah. for because they just said that they're corrupt and our people are getting killed for nothing? Mm. Or are they cheering because Wagner wants to kill Ukrainians more efficiently? Yeah. And we still don't know the answer to that. So, no. no. So there we go. Well, I think that's an interesting note to end uh, Espresso Martini on. But we will be continuing on Extra Shot. So if you want to hear our, uh, about Swiss spies, Mossad's uh, operations in Iran and more, join us by going to patreon.com forward slash secrets and spies and you will be able to join us straight away after that but for those who are not going to join us thank you very much for listening to espresso martini um if you do have any thoughts or comments feel free to drop us an email at secrets and spies podcast at gmail.com um if you are going to leave a review please leave five star reviews as the ones we prefer but <laughs> But we do live in a democracy, so you can say what you like. I can't really say or influence you. But obviously, if you do leave a five-star review, we do appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Matt, thank you for your time. And uh, thank you. I'll catch you on the other side. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.